Before we get started, I just wanted to say we lost the first couple minutes of the program where we realized that we had uncovered Jewel using our research bodies mod. We now know that there is such a thing as Jewel, however, we know, that's, that's all we know. We know of Pole as well, but we're going to have to launch a, a research mission in order to learn more. But anyways... Hello everybody and welcome back to KXP, Kerbal Exploration Program, where we aim to send Kerbal into the farthest reaches of the cosmos. Today, however, we are going to be focusing on a rescue mission, and it's going to take up the majority of the episode, so we're going to just kind of focus on grabbing our contracts right here, the research celestial body that will let us know more about Jewel, and we're going to continue searching the skies. That costs us money, but we have 1.7 million, so we'll be pretty good from that. Uh, this is one that the rover on Minmus can take care of, so we're going to try to do that as well. Uh, not in this mission. Uh, this is primarily going to be a rescue mission to bring Jeb, Bill, Bob, and Val back home uh, so they can start working on bigger and better projects. So I have a couple here. I have a lot of contract uh, packs that add different things that allow us to do different things but we're going to be kind of picking and choosing at the time at the moment I think now is about the time where we can kind of focus on what we want to do and we'll just try to find contracts that can supplement that for the time being so now we have 1374 science so we're gonna go ahead in here and spend it I'm just gonna focus on the ones that we unlocked which is nuclear propulsion that's gonna help us get interplanetary. We're going to do aerodynamics for the air brakes and the bigger um, fairings. I think that's going to be very useful. Uh, this large volume containment is going to be crucial because we've been running into some frame drop issues and having a single large tank will help. We also got precision propulsion for smaller vacuum efficient engines. We're picking up specialized construction for a multitude of pieces but primarily a shielded docking port and this inter, uh, uh, space launch pad system. We're picking up supersonic flight for to, to better get space planes going. Specialized control also has a lot of good things like reaction wheels and uh, avionics. And with that, we only have 44 science left and we are going to move on. Like I mentioned, we're gonna skip the build for this. It's a long enough mission and we're gonna leave a lot of it unedited, but if you kind of notice, it's the same basic lander that I typically build for anything. Uh, all the other missions that you've seen previously on my channel is the same typical standard. We are going to be making this kind of a unofficial KSP POV flight because we are going to be flying it uh, through the probe control room since there is no pilot on, on board. And uh, when we return them uh, back, if we can safely manage to land this probe, we will be doing so in IVA mode as well. So let's just go ahead and get our probe control room ready. We are using the DE plus MAS version of it. There's several versions of this, uh, of this particular mod. I highly recommend anybody who's doing any IVA modes to pick up the Revivia mod and that allows you to cycle between different IVA modes uh, and pick the one that you want. I have been really really enjoying the low-tech analog version of the probe control room however I'm not kind of limiting myself to uh, the role play that I was doing KSP POV with the progression but uh, so we're gonna use this with some advanced screens to really get us where we need to go. But anyways, there we are. We have liftoff. We have a healthy thrust rate ratio, so it takes us no time at all to reach uh, 100 meters per second. And there we go. We hit 100, so we're going to start tipping over just ever so slightly. In my test, I realized that taking the typical efficient launch will just result in this flipping over because it is quite top heavy so we're basically going to take a very straight ascent passing through the cloud layer it's always nice to be able to see that 
That's uh, provided by the whole cams VDS mod that allows you to see outside the craft. Anyways, we're just tipping over ever so slightly. We're going to have a very vertical ascent, and then once we reach our apoapsis, we're just going to burn horizontally. Not the most efficient way, but it is a way that we can guarantee that we reach orbit. And our engine is powerful enough that it should have no problem handling that at all. We're really starting to get a handle on our lifting vehicles and making sure that we can uh, utilize the things that we unlocked to get to space a lot easier. So now my apoapsis is above 70 kilometers. It's at 80, we're going to raise it up a little bit higher, use some of our fuel just to make sure that we have enough room to uh, tip over when we need to. And just past 100 kilometers. And uh, we're going to hang out here at about 116 kilometers apoapsis. Now uh, we still have a, a good chunk of fuel left in our tank. So we're going to be able to utilize that to circularize. And in this mission we're going to kind of utilize this MechJeb screen a little more often. So let's go ahead and point ourselves to the node. We created a circularization maneuver with that screen and now we're pointing ourselves to the node and we're going to be able to use it to execute the maneuver for us so it's going to automatically start on time but more importantly it's actually going to stop on time So as it tips over and lines up with the maneuver node, it will actually activate time warp for us and bring us closer to the time for maneuver. So as you hear there, and you can see up on the screen right in the very top middle, our time warp went up to times 10, but since it's very close maneuver, that's all it needed. And uh, it automatically uh, fired when it needed to, so MechJeb seems to be handling it pretty okay here. I haven't had much luck using the typical uh, window of MechJeb, uh, the one where it brings up all the different screens and stuff, but I have been enjoying using MechJeb via the probe control room and the raster prop monitors. There we go. Our Lifting stage ran out of fuel, so we separated it. It did cause an explosion, which was worrisome, so I'm going to go here into my log and see that it destroyed the reaction wheel that was attached to the lower stage. So nothing to worry about, no damage done to the vehicle that will take us there. I have a little bit of time while we are circularizing, so I'm going to go over here to the crash specialist desk instead of a few windows for myself. We heard the maneuver finishing up as our engines flamed out. We'll check uh, our height here. As we can see, our periapsis is about 114 or so kilometers, which means that we are safely going to stay in space. I put the crew here, but that's just the people in the probe control room and since they are in no danger they uh, don't have any feelings to record. This screen's a little bit different than the rest so I'm not going to mess with that I'm just going to leave it on the external camera and return to Gene Herman's seat to focus on the next part of the mission. And uh, I mentioned before I'm going to leave this mostly unedited a lot of what we ended up doing was uh, stuff that we haven't done in this series yet before. And I was actually pretty efficient with my with my time here and uh, what I did with the craft. So there wasn't actually really much to cut out as far as even for time's length. It is a little bit longer of an episode, but this is a rescue mission. So I figured if any time uh, was worthwhile devoting to 
to focusing on every part. I think uh, rescue missions are that because uh, they are inherently dangerous and inherently full of adventure. So here we are. We uh, are targeting Midmas so that way we can have an idea of our relative inclination because after all you will need to change uh, your inclination in order to rendezvous with Midmas. So right now our relative inclination is 13. We are close to the descending node. And we are burning anti-normal I believe and as you see here by where my mouse is hovering our relative inclination is dropping down we want to get that as close to zero as possible and unfortunately we ran out of fuel in our uh, lower stage I was kind of hoping that we could have at least used some of that to transfer us but apparently not We'll have to use some of our side boosters and center booster to adjust our inclination as well as bring us out to Midmas. So at 1.8 it started to go, or actually at 1.6 it started to go back up. So at 1.8 we cut it out and uh, that's not too bad. A relative inclination of 1.8 uh, is still good enough to create a rendezvous. So now using the Astrogator mod, we are going to go ahead and select uh, a maneuver for Midmist, and it's uh, actually going to happen in 7 minutes 20 seconds, so it's very nice. Our craft is highly maneuverable because at this point it has a reaction wheel right in the center of it, and it can maneuver pretty well without any kind of RCS or anything. So we reach our maneuver node uh, uh, heading very quickly, and MechJeb takes over on the time warp and we are coming down to where the maneuver is going to be and shortly thereafter we fire so I did skip ahead a little bit um, it takes quite a bit of time to leave a uh, curving sphere of influence and enter Midmas's. I guess we're not leaving the sphere of influence but to to extend our orbit out and so I just kind of skipped ahead until where things really started taking off and once again we have mech Jeb handling our burn so it should turn off automatically and we can see in the purple number the closest approach right there we are now under a million meters. We're about 567 kilometers, which is pretty good. It's, we still have some delta V left in uh, with a maneuver that's set, and I believe Astrogator likes to split it up into two. So let's go ahead and highlight the node, so that way we are pointing in the right direction, and we're going to make sure that uh, we execute the next node, and we'll just let Astrogator take over. Previously, I would always cancel the second maneuver that Astrogator liked to do, but uh, this time I just decided to let it go, and for some reason it flipped us onto the other side of the planet and didn't actually bring us any closer to our goal. I guess that's good because then it sets you up on a re free ret uh, return trajectory, I would imagine. That's why it wants us to come in on that side of the moon, but... I'm not looking for a free trajectory. I want to uh, circularize in the direction of its orbit so that way I can utilize uh, the direction that we're going for our landing. So I go ahead and I extend both the uh, satellite uh, or the, the communication dishes as well as the solar panels. And then I opened our cargo bay for a little bit just to test to make sure that that action group was working and it was. So now we have our intercept. Uh, it's now just going to be a matter of making it exactly what we want. Going to keep our vessel viewer up there. It's beautiful seeing that uh, blue orb 
with the right mods just looking so much like Earth. I can't wait till we can reach this uh, this part in RP1 and see the real solar system reborn Earth from space. So we're going to bring ourselves to about halfway through our orbit, right about there. Gonna slow down time, and we're going to make a slight adjustment so that way we can bring our periapsis a little bit lower, saving us some uh, some effort later. It does take less delta V to circularize at a higher altitude, but we don't really need to worry about that with this craft. I believe this is over-engineered and we'll be discarding some of our fuel by the end of it. So I want to send myself closer, but going both prograde and retrograde seem to just send it in different directions. Both, uh, both seem to send it positively. So 369.77 kilometers above the surface, that's our interaction. And I'm trying to do this with minimal map usage. I'd like to plot my maneuvers uh, through the uh, raster prop monitors in the probe control room. However, I, I wasn't having a good time eyeballing it, and so I decided to allow myself uh, an inner map maneuver. Once again, this isn't set to be a POV series is not meant to be, a, you know, anything uh, like a challenge like that. So I need to, I need to relax and allow myself to make proper maneuvers, because the only goal for this, uh, for this series is to explore the cosmos. I'm really excited it was Jewel that we found because Jewel is going to be interesting to study uh, with the Black Racks volumetric clouds active and sending, sending probes there for the first time. We also learned of Pole, which is a moon of Jewel, I believe. And uh, so we'll be able to land on something as well. So it's not just uh, it's not just the gas giant that we found. We actually found a moon of it. And maybe we'll land someone there and keep them there uh, set up so that way eventually they can Whenever we discover more moons of Jewel, they can go visit that. So Mechjeb pointed itself towards the maneuver and uh, time warped its way to it as well. It's a very short burn, just 3.5 meters per second. But that is enough to bring us down to about 22 kilometers above the surface. And I know that on Minmus, that is a safe enough periapsis. We should have no problem, uh, run no risk of running into any mountains or anything. And our inclination is 1.9, so we're going to be coming in pretty equatorially, which is nice. But, you know, obviously we had planned for all that using the map mode, so it's nothing, nothing to write home about. And we can keep an eye on our transfer uh, right here where it says transfer min miss at. Uh, we can watch this number and once it reaches zero, then we know we will be in min miss's uh, sphere of influence. It's amazing how much you can do with just these uh, these windows alone. The, the numbers on the screen, the uh, nav ball, the altimeter, and the rate of descent, all of that stuff, all these screens, you can uh, you can do quite a lot with. And it's, it's just, it's amazing. I love it. Alright, so our transfer to Minimus is happening now, and as the screen changes, it shows you our uh, flyby pass. So now we're going to use MechJab to circularize at the next periapsis. That plots in a maneuver. Let's go back to the main page, point ourselves towards the node, and then once we reach that, we are going to hit execute next node. And that should handle the circularization. It should bring us around 22 uh, 
uh, kilometers periapsis, apoapsis as well. So now that the craft is pointed towards the node, it will automatically take over on the time warp, bring us close, and then stop us right before it needs to fire. We can see a little bit of the moon pass by in our hole cam, but since we're coming in on the dark side, it'll be a little bit before we can actually truly see the moon below us. Back Jeb fires on time as expected. And since we have five Terrier engines going at once, we have a healthy thrust to weight ratio, it means that it takes no time at all to circularize. And with that little spin and the deletion of the blue markers, we know our maneuver is complete. 20, and we are 20,000 kilometers above the surface. So now we're going to go ahead and highlight the correct uh, craft so we know where to land. And uh, I have not yet mastered precision landing in uh, POV form, so we will be doing a lot of map, uh, map flight here, map planning. But first, let's uh, time warp until the uh, target is actually in the daylight. Because precision landing is hard enough, but to do it in the in the dark, no thank you. All right, at our apoapsis, we're going to go ahead and plot in our landing burn. We want to give it some uh, some normal and anti-normal along with our retrograde so that way we can kind of bring ourselves above the point and try to also take into account the rotation of the planet and the, where the target is going to be at the given time of our arrival. A little bit of guesswork. Uh, there is some math that can be done here. Smarter minds than I can tell you what that math is. And they'll have a better time utilizing that math, but for me, I'm just going to try to eyeball it uh, and use my experience in this game uh, to figure out where I need to be. But now it's time for our descent burn, and uh, once again, we've got a lot of thrust, so it takes no time at all. And we should, uh, should be pretty good. There probably will be a little course correction as we go along. So now about that, right above our landing zone, I'm going to plot in a maneuver to kind of kill our momentum. And uh, we don't necessarily have to take this maneuver, but it will give us an idea of where we are in relation to uh, the target. It's only a three second burn, uh, so, or excuse me, a 0 0.3 second, uh, yeah, 0 0.3 second burn. So we gotta be careful. We could very easily reverse our direction and start ascending. we we'll point ourselves towards the node and I am a little bit foolishly going to let MacJeb take care of it. It's a little bit dangerous to do it that close. And if something goes wrong, if MacJeb doesn't fire, if it fires for too long or not long enough. Uh, what I was circling there with the mouse was the destination that the rover was supposed to make, the Jeb, Bob, Bill, Val, and Bill, they were supposed to make it down to that little island in the flats, but unfortunately there was too much debris, uh, too much space uh, scatter in between them, and it was making driving very, very, very difficult. So we that's why we decided just to mount a rescue mission grab them take them home and we'll set up something in that spot later so now just plotting in my last little maneuver because Meg Jeb kept failing me I was not getting as close as I thought I was going to uh, so we are not going to use Meg Jeb for this and instead we are going to rely on full uh, remote tech's uh, flight computer. So we're going to go ahead and point ourselves towards the node and click execute. And then we are going to let that handle and see if it will actually burn us 
to the point where we want it to. Go ahead and let that do its maneuver. Very uh, short burn. A little goes a long way here. And as we see, it actually brought us to where we wanted it to. So I'm still not sold on Mech Jeb. I am sold on Flight Computer, however. So we took a look at Outsider Craft and we saw that we could uh, visually see our target. So that's nice. We are going to be close. So I'm going to turn off the flight computer because that will prevent you from selecting your SAS sometimes. So if you are using remote tech and you have that problem, just make sure you turn off flight computer and uh, you'll be able to line up the way you need to. We're actually uh, approaching the surface pretty quickly, so it's a good thing that we took took control when we did point ourselves retrograde. We're going to bring our landing camera up on the big screen. We're going to change this side camera to something else, something that will let us give us some information. Our landing gear is now deploying because we are below 1,000 meters. And as you can see, we're coming in fast. We watch our suicide burn countdown, but unfortunately we were like 0.1 second off from where we needed to be. So unfortunately we hit the ground and did not stop, but uh, fortunately we did not break any of our engines or our landing gears or anything like that. So now all we gotta do is kill our horizontal velocity and make sure we land safely. But we're coming down at less than five meters per second, so. I feel pretty confident in this landing. And with that, we have made contact. We have safely taken our ship from Kerbin, launched it at mid -miss, landed at a specific location, and did real, real nice in our landing. Well, you know, not perfect, but good enough in the craft still uh, survived and is functional however we are much farther than I would like and like I mentioned before all those little rocks in our way will cause uh, issues if we try to drive the rover over so I think our best bet is to take our rescue craft and even though it landed safely launch it once once more and uh, try to bring ourselves a little bit closer to our crew. So we're going to get our cameras back up, get our nav ball in position, and we are going to take off from the surface. We're just going to launch ourselves up a little bit, and then we're going to point towards our target. It's below the horizon, so we have to be uh, kind of careful, because at this point now we are speeding towards the surface. Uh, 25 meters per second is not great. Uh, I'm not entirely sure the best way to pinpoint land here. I fire a couple times extra, but I will find out later that I didn't need to do that because once we go into map mode, we, uh, or uh, excuse me, not map mode, once we go into third person mode and we turn on our trajectories, we see that we, uh, we went very far out. So we're going to burn retrograde to bring us in. And then I'm going to just kind of manually eyeball it and adjust our trajectory as we go along. I point prograde to bring us further out. And then I'm going to point uh, normal to bring us leftwards. And this would be good back in the day. For some reason, there's been a change. And typically, those red cursor, that's where you would land. However, I've noticed uh, recently, it's actually the blue line is the correct one of where you land. So I'm going to burn radial out to kind of extend my landing zone. And that should be good enough. Uh, and so we can head back here into the probe control room, point ourselves retrograde, and get ready for landing. Hopefully a, a better landing. Uh, cannot quick save because we are below a certain altitude and so hopefully we can get this correct because I didn't quick save when we landed either so it's been quite a bit it may actually be Kerbin when the last time I quick saved 
Let's try to do this right. And less than three meters per second descent. So we are coming down very safe, very slowly, very securely. 25, 20, 10, 5, 2. There we go, made contact. Everything is still in, well, still intact. And, uh, we have gotten ourselves much, 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 much closer to our goal. So let's go ahead and lock our stage. That way we don't accidentally set off our side boosters. And then we are going to uh, call it a day in the probe control room. They did uh, one, one heck of a job getting us here. Gene Kerman goes to the radio, tries to contact them, but for some reason doesn't get any chatter. So instead he goes and quick saves because none of us want to do that again. It's fun, but when you've already successfully landed and you accidentally do something wrong, you don't want to do it again. So yeah, look at that. Look how close we brought our craft. Uh, we did do a little bit of exterior adjustments with our trajectories mod, but all in all, still landed it in uh, POV mode, so. But anyways, we are going to switch over to our rover and uh, we are going to work on bringing our Kerbals on over. So we are close, but Val decides that she wants to drive the rover just a little bit closer, make things a little more convenient for everybody as they switch on over. So she turns off the brakes and pushes forward. Once again, these, these rocks are quite a challenge. I, I enjoy the challenge of having collisions on. I feel that it's very realistic. And even though it can be frustrating and can ruin missions like this, uh, all that means is that we have to be a little bit smarter with our crafts. And uh, if we want to continue to do the things that we want to do, we have to send better missions. So we will learn. Part of this mission, however, this rescue mission, is that we have a storage container with uh, one part of a mod that allows us to attach a rover brain uh, on top of this and we will be able to pilot it uh, remotely and in the background and we can send it where we want it to go but of course it was this uh, rover wasn't built with it initially so we're going to have to use KIS uh, and KAS to uh, attach it uh, using our engineer so we go ahead and get Bill out of his seat and heads towards the back of the craft. And uh, he's going to make his way out to the EVA. Having a little bit of problem because we have our HUD off, so I wasn't able to uh, click on the door well enough. I assumed that it was because we didn't have our ladder extended, so I went ahead and clicked the action group that brings out the ladder on this piece, but turns out it wasn't the ladder at all. I just hadn't uh, focused on the right spot. So as you see there, a little yellow prompt tells us that we we're focused in the right spot. And that's what allowed me to get out. So Bill is eva first one to see the rescue ship with his own eyes, using through the eyes of the Kerbal mod to be in first person mode while EVAing. It's a lot of fun. Highly recommend it. So we're going to go ahead and climb aboard and grab ourselves the rover brain. However, I am just going to skip a bit of this footage because it's a lot of trial and error. And in the end, it turns out that we cannot actually attach this the way that we wanted to. I don't know. Maybe I'm missing something. Maybe... Uh, my engineer isn't a high enough level, but it just wasn't working out. So we're just going to go ahead and skip ahead to the end. Um, as you see here, I placed it, but it's not actually attached. And I don't have any options really at my disposal to attach it. 
So unfortunately, Bill's job here is over. As you see, he just simply walking into it is is enough to kick it off. So this is not going to work out. We're that part of the mission is a failure, but that's okay because that was really secondary to the actual rescuing of our Kerbals. So Bill, go ahead and get yourself situated inside the craft. You have one of the worst seats, so you might as well get yourself comfortable in it as soon as you can. So one of my input keys is set incorrectly and every time I uh, RCS vertically it zooms in the camera so I need to change that at some point. So what we need to do here is we bring our Kerbal into one of the pods and then we're going to transfer them into the, the command seat that is tucked away inside that uh, service module. And two of the Kerbals are going to be tucked inside that service module very uncomfortably. And then our two pilots are going to inhabit the actual capsules themselves. Yep. <sighs> Stupid rover brain. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get Bob out. And uh, he is going to collect all the science that they had gathered uh, and uh, do any pickup science that is left to be done. And it seems that there actually was some science left to be done in this section of the moon, this biome. So uh, it was a good thing that he did that. But now he needs to go and gather everything. So he clicks the button to have all the science experiments stored in the experiment storage unit. And that'll help in gathering stuff. It's a good thing this ladder was here and created a platform. Uh, unfortunately, nobody clicked the action group to open the bay doors, but it was, you know, something he can do himself, so not a problem. So he's going to collect the science experiments and uh, from the experiments themselves, if they have anything, and from the storage unit. That storage unit didn't have anything. This arm never scanned anything. Uh, unfortunately, we did have a mission to scan a particular surface feature, but it will be too much to try to drive this thing around and find it. We'll have to do that in another, in another mission entirely. So I didn't really pay attention to where I was going very much as I was uh, RCSing up so I ended up landing down exactly where I took off, but tripping over myself and falling down along the way. But this time I added a little forward momentum to my movement and uh, successfully made it to the other side of the craft, which was what I was trying to do. I swear, certain Kerbals I have more luck navigating with RCS than others, and I feel like maybe there's something to that certain certain times it's a little easier to control than others i really like the look of this this piece that little radar screen um i believe that's from the scansat mod it's supposed to show you different resources uh nothing science to do there we see that we can collect some science from the uh what is that seismo uh seismograph or something the little surface drill and the laser drill uh, had some science we collected that so now that we have all of our science we can go ahead and dump it off into this uh, into this rescue craft and then get uh, get him aboard as well so we're just gonna carefully jetpack our way over try to make it up without knocking the craft over or knocking ourselves away as well. Okay. Connect onto the ladder here. We're going to get rid of, or go back into our HUD because we couldn't board. So we're going to uh, cancel that 
and we're going to dump off all of the experiments that we can dump off in there and then we're going to try to dump off the rest of it in the Mach 1 capsule and then hopefully we'll be able to uh, hopefully we'll be able to enter with all the experiments available so we'll go ahead and store that material or those uh, that data and so now we have, between the two capsules, we have all the data available that our rover took during its journey, and we could safely make it inside the capsule, so we know that we have all the data. So it's good. Just taking a look around the capsule real fast before buckling in, and once again, he too will be transferred from his comfortable seat inside the Mach 1 capsule into a cramped uh, external seat tucked away in a service module. So there we go, he is situated in there as well. Uh, I love it when a mission comes together. I I was so excited to, to get to this point and uh, sometimes you wanna just, you know, take a break from Kerbal. You're like, okay, I landed I landed the rope or the rescue craft and I think maybe now is time to just, you know, end, end the recording, so, you know, quit the game, go do something else. But then there's other times where it's just like, I just need to, I just need to keep going because we're, we're close. All we need to do is get our pilots aboard and then bring this thing home. So Jeb comes out and uh, he's going to be the first pilot aboard. Uh, and because he got first pick, he's going to take... The, the most comfy capsule being the Mach 1. I believe we're also using DE MAS uh, interior view. It's a little glitchy right there though. So let's hop in our chair. Yeah, so this is the DE plus MAS uh, advanced future uh, IVA. Gives us uh, some quality <sighs> stupid rover brain. Those can give us some uh, high quality. Oh, look at how shiny those rocks are. I don't know if we have diffused lighting on yet. If we had put it on at this point or if this was recorded before that came out. But uh, we have included that in our gameplay. I haven't really noticed too much of a difference, but I, I kind of haven't been paying attention uh, because I know that the, the diffuse lighting is only on certain parts. But now all that is left is for Val to head her way on over. And of course, being uh, a neat and, and completionist as she is, you can go ahead and turn off all the systems that don't need to be on. And uh, although, however, she cannot see in the dark, so she will turn that light back on. And she's going to leave it on because if we ever get another Kerbal in here, they're going to need to be able to see as well. But there's no need for the rover to have all these screens on if nobody's looking at them. Keep its solar, uh, solar panels uh, retracted so nothing happens to them. And uh, close our bay doors. Make sure everything is tucked neatly inside so no damage happens to them. She will leave the ladder down. Uh, she's going to need it to get out, but also uh, for anyone who may come back, it gives them a nice and easy entrance into the rover. Because we're not done with Midness. We're like, I, I plan on building a sort of base here, um, something to kind of mine materials and hopefully build crafts. I'd like to, I have extra planetary launch pads installed. And so I'd like to build kind of a little bit of a workshop here on Minmus and use that as a launching point for bigger projects. So I'm excited. And uh, so this rover, even though it ran into some, some troubles, uh, it may become useful later on to other Kerbals. But here we are, Valentina is in the capsule, the Mach 1 landing landing can um, also with the DE plus MAS 
IVA interior. So let's go ahead and quick save because we are going to get ourselves ready to go. This turns on the communications, gets a little notification from KSC that they are cleared for takeoff. Turns on the lights, gets the screens the way that she likes it. There's not much piloting that she's going to be doing from in here. A lot of it's going to be done uh, via Jeb, which is nice because uh, she did all the piloting on the way to Minmus and all the rover driving. I would take a quick look inside the service bay and it is not comfortable in there. Dark and lonely. But they can survive, so that's all that matters. So we come back to Jeb, we go ahead and turn everything the, the way we want it. We're going to clear our targets, make sure we don't have anything selected so we don't accidentally point in a direction that we don't want to be pointed in. I love that there's a map already for uh, Midmiss that we can see and we can plot our uh, ascent through this particular screen so we're going to go ahead and try it out and all it takes is selecting our appalapsis and selecting launch and then it just kind of automatically points you horizontally and uh, it will go ahead and take over on the rest of it And uh, it had time warped us up to the apoapsis, and it will take over on the circularization burn, all without us having to worry about anything. It's been kind of nice. I have forced myself to do a lot of things manually in the KSP POV Season 3, um, but uh, it's it's been kind of nice to be able to play around with these more advanced technologies and the automated process of rocket launches. I am strongly considering a POV Season 4, especially after all that we've been doing, but I'm hesitant about starting it just now because we've we've spent so much time doing a lot of the same stuff, going, you know, going orbital, going to the moon, going to mid -miss, waiting for everything, and... Uh, and so I want to make a little more progress. I want to explore more of the cosmos in this playthrough first before we limit ourselves to a new start. Uh, but we will be doing some POV here and there. I don't think we're going to focus solely on it. Um, even though we've been doing a lot of these missions in POV, I just kind of felt, uh, felt the call, felt the need to be able to do it. Because also in the previous POV series is... POV series, um, we uh, we were running on a, a much much worse machine, and so we were running at about 15 frames per second. So everything was very slow, and I couldn't really move very much. And now that we have a machine that can handle it, we can we can play this game in real time, and it just it's so much fun. I often like to say that Kerbal Space Program is a space program simulator, uh, but playing it in IVA mode like this turns it into an astronaut simulator because you are the one in the capsule and you are the one in control. I highly recommend uh, playing this way. If you have Kerbal Space Program uh, and you have the ability to play with mods, then I, I definitely recommend trying it at least uh, at least once. All right, so we once again used the uh, computer inside the ship to plot in our return trajectory, and we're going to try to come in at 70 kilome 75 kilometers, so that way we're not, we don't want to come in and air break. We have plenty of Delta V left in our uh, tanks. We, we still haven't even gotten rid of our side boosters, and uh, once we do, we'll still have a full other tank and engine with that so yeah so we don't need to we don't need to be 
efficient. We don't need to aero brake or anything. We can just get ourselves at a nice comfortable altitude, 75 kilometers above the surface, come into orbit, and then focus on landing from there. Like I mentioned, this, uh, this craft is a little overbuilt. So we're just kind of drifting about, looking at different uh, different directions to points to see if we can see our uh, our departure in the best possible light. So now let's just kind of rotate our craft a little bit, and we get. A better view of Midmus. So as we depart from it, we have something, something fun to see, something interesting to say goodbye to. And there we are. We are leaving Midmus's sphere of influence, and then a short little freeze, and then suddenly, new screen shows us that we are out. Of Minus's sphere of influence, and we will be re-entering Kerbin's. But uh, something weird happens, and I can't quite explain it. We definitely don't have Principia installed, but this is something that would be more familiar than that. Regardless, we find ourselves on an exit trajectory. We are going to be leaving Kerbin's sphere of influence, so we're going to go ahead and plot a capture burn, which only makes the graphical glitch that much uh, more extreme but we're just going to ignore it for now and just plot in our return about 74 kilometers above the surface and that looks good still fun to see though all right so we have our maneuver and so now it's just a matter of plotting it in and uh, executing it. And then hopefully that will bring us close to becoming home and uh, one step further to a successful mission and uh, successful Kerbals. So let's point ourselves towards our maneuver. And we are going to use uh, Remote Tech's flight computer once again. I feel like it was just a, a little bit more accurate. And right now I, I want to be accurate because we are quickly on an escape trajectory and if things don't go right, uh, it's gonna be a, a little bit harder to get back home from the sun sphere of influence. We're time warping forward, getting ourselves close to our maneuver, and remote tech takes over, and uh, pretty soon we will find ourselves circularized once more, but not just circularized, but with a, a low periapsis that will line us up to bring us home. We're watching our periapsis right there, and for some reason, it pushes us past our uh, our desired periapsis, and uh, we just keep burning, and our engines have flared out. So it turns out what we ended up doing was uh, when we plotted our maneuver, I didn't pay attention to the fact that we had reversed our uh, trajectory, reversed our orbit around Kerbin, so that's why we kept firing. The remote tech was on that, but... Uh, the, the little beeping that we heard earlier was because our side boosters had flamed out. So we could have, we could have uh, jettisoned them a little bit earlier, but we uh, decided to keep them instead. So now our periapsis is 72 kilometers, which means that once we plot a, uh, a circularization burn, then we can safely come back home. So let's go open up MechJeb and plot a maneuver at the next periapsis. 
we're going to go ahead and point towards the node, which uh, isn't very far from where we're at, so that's nice. And uh, it's uh, it says that we cannot warp any faster while the ship is under acceleration. Not really sure why it said that, but. So let's go ahead and jettison our side boosters. They had some uh, separatrons and explosives to make sure that cleared up any space trash and we didn't harm our current ship. Always love seeing those, those work. All right, so we went and cleared our maneuver. Just wasn't feeling good about trusting Mech Jeb with it. We're gonna plot in our maneuver as well. We're gonna trust Precise Maneuver, but you know, at some point you gotta trust one of these tools. But yeah, we plot in Precise Maneuver. It's gonna take 914 Delta V, and we have much more than that. So we will be good for not only our capture, but also our descent. And with a periapsis of 72 kilometers, even if we ran it out of fuel, uh, we could very easily uh, get out and push at our apoapsis to bring ourselves down. So I feel very confident in our return trajectory as long as we can manage our burns. So Max Jeb's not wanting to point towards the node for some reason. Um, I'm having a little difficulty trusting it, so I'm going to go ahead and open up Flight Computer and use that to uh, handle the maneuver. And instantly when I click point at node on the Flight Computer, it points at the node, so I'm, uh, I'm more likely to trust that. It's a, it's, it's, that's the hard part of the Astronaut Simulator, is you have all these tools at your disposal all the things, but it really comes down to the astronaut and what they feel is, you know, comfortable, what they feel is right. If they feel like they shouldn't trust their guidance system and that they would be better off handling it themselves, then that is another thing. I have a quick little intercept with the MUN once again because of our, uh, uh our extensive retrograde burn so I was a little bit worried about this but it looks like it's a pretty high uh, pretty high pass by so I'm just gonna go ahead and time warp ahead being very cautious make sure that there's no glitching about this but nonetheless we're gonna have to do the flyby so we get a little connection from one of our satellites which is kind of cool makes uh, just a little bit of proof that everything is working the way that it should. And as quickly as we entered, we are now out of the moon's, uh, the Minimus's sphere of influence, and we can safely make our way back home. But when I jump into the uh, cockpit once again, find ourselves out of electric charge, and uh, I'm unsure why, considering that we should have batteries on here. We should still have our solar panels on here. We did jettison some of our solar panels with our side stage, but I could have sworn we had some on the center bit. But uh, when I go out to look at it, turns out that I do. However, they are not facing in a way that they can actually get any sunlight. And so our craft has no electrical charge and for, at least for the time being, it has no way of gaining electrical charge. There's nothing really we can do. Uh, we have our maneuver plotted in, which is good because had we not had electrical charge at the time that we plotted it, we wouldn't have been able to. So there's really nothing left to do except time warp our way to uh, the maneuver and then hope that everything works out correctly and we can make our way home. If the craft ends up stalling out and has no uh, electricity and cannot re-enter the atmosphere then at least we can send a rescue mission into low carbon orbit and that's as far as we need to go we don't have to follow this huge elliptical orbit we don't have to go to another celestial body we don't have to precision land anywhere 
you know, if this rescue mission doesn't turn out well enough, we can just send a rescue mission for the rescue mission. All right, we have our three minutes to count down. So let's go ahead and time warp again. We're gonna be burning on the uh, dark side of the moon, or excuse me, the dark side of Kerbin. <laughs> and uh, I'm adjusting the uh, maneuver a little bit and I decided to cancel it. We have look control. Um, I just adjusted it to allow us to come back into the atmosphere because I am unsure of our abilities now. So we're time warping to our maneuver and thankfully we hear our engines roar which means that the flight computer is handling it and uh, if all goes according to plan we will be returning. But as as you may know if you are a long time watcher for our channel then when you hear this song Nothing is guaranteed. So, we shall see. I was hoping that we would gain some electrical charge by our engines burning, but apparently not. This is really making me want to include uh, reserve batteries on my crafts moving forward because I didn't like not having control. I don't have SAS control, I don't have screen control, there's nothing I can do from this craft. Yeah. Even our displays give us no information. Got 20 seconds left in our burn. Can't really tell uh, if we were circularizing except for the orbit info top left. At this point where the rest of the craft is uh, dead in the water, no electricity, I feel like having that information is almost cheating. But you know, that's just a self-imposed rule. So I have no control over SAS because we have no electrical charge, which means that we will be at the mercy of the aerodynamic forces on our entire descent down. All of our Kerbals seem intact, healthy and happy, happy enough anyways, but uh, Little did they know that the worst is yet to come. We take a look at our nav ball and we are not on the retrograde marker. We are strayed a bit. Keep switching back and forth between the different curvals, but they're not really much to do with any of them. We just have to wait and hope. And with our turn, we get a little bit of electrical uh, control because our solar panels are getting a little bit of light. But we rotated a little too much and once again put ourselves in a position where we didn't have any electrical charge. Briefest amount of hope gone in an instant. Our periapsis is 32 kilometers, which is a little steep for my liking. I like to come in at 42 kilometers. I just, I feel like the angle is just much better, but 32 kilometers will bring us home. Uh, we will be landing here very shortly. I use some of the remaining fuel in our tank to burn, slow us down a little bit, kind of straighten us out and hopefully get to retrograde. And then we jettison it, exposing our heat shield 
and leaving us with no other option but to land. Unfortunately, that is not looking like a very uh, probable outcome given the fact that we have no SAS control. And this craft isn't the most aerodynamic. I can't, I can't assume that it will automatically point retrograde. But nonetheless, the heat starts to appear and we are wildly spinning around. And there's nothing we can do. And before we know it, we have stabilized to the best of our abilities. And we are no longer swinging around, but that also means that we are now gathering heat. Uh, the swinging around was helpful because it dissipates the heat and doesn't leave it uh, on one part for too long. But now all we have is the, is to have faith in our heat shield. Hopefully it doesn't explode. And then that's when the blue skies appear again, the heat is gone, and we have safely made it through the atmosphere with all four Kerbals intact. Still have no electrical charge. Nothing we can do now. Uh, hopefully we can still stage our parachutes, otherwise it would be a very sad ending to a very hopeful and very powerful and positive mission. Being able to retrieve Kerbals stuck on a distant celestial body is a good proof of our abilities as an agency. So it's right then that I realized I was actually pointed upside down in that last bit of the atmosphere. It wasn't the heat shield that was developing the heat, it was our parachutes. But uh, thankfully they survived the heat and uh, will be carrying us home safely. But anyways, that is going to bring us to the end of this episode. I'm excited. In the next episode, we are going to mount a rescue mission for another Kerbal strand in space and hopefully gain ourselves another Kerbal knot in our roster. And then from there, I think we're going to start focusing our eyes on Jewel. I'm actually really excited to move on to this next stage in the KXP series. And I hope you are as well. But anyways, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're looking forward for more KXP. If you did, please consider giving me a like, drop me a comment, let me know your thoughts, and I will see you all in the next one. Take care.